Our special guest this evening is Professor Charles Marsh from University of Virginia. Uh, again, he's here to talk about his book, A Life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I want you guys to give a very big round of applause for Professor Charles Marsh. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you so much. What a, uh, what a fun night, and thanks to all of you for being here um, on this, what is this, Arts Night in Art Walk in, in LA. Uh, this is my 20th book talk. Uh, on a book tour that began April 22nd in Harlem. And I am thrilled to be in Los Angeles and on this warm, uh, kind of balmy night that, that uh, kind of takes me back to some book talks I did in the Deep South some time ago. I am thrilled for, uh, uh, to be here and exceedingly grateful to the good folks at the last bookstore I am um, I am here to tell you that independent bookstores in America are making a comeback, and I have seen evidence of this uh, from, <laughs> from New York to New Orleans to small towns in the Deep South uh, and here in, in LA as well. So uh, thanks for being here. What we'll do is um, I'll talk for a few minutes and, and read a passage or two from Strange Glory, and then we'll have maybe 20 minutes or so for some questions and answers, and we'll see what happens. Um, so I, um, I began this book, this uh, biography called Strange Glory, in the spring of 2007, during a semester when I had a, a sabbatical at the University of Berlin. I was the Dietrich Bonhoeffer visiting professor for the spring semester, and I know that sounds like a, a very prestigious title, uh, but I should tell you that the fellowship came without any, any salary, without any travel stipend. I don't think I had access to a printer, but uh, I did have a cozy office uh, in, uh, in the Bergstrasse, and if you know Berlin, it's right across the River Spray from the Berlin Dome. And soon enough, I made my trip uh, to, first trip, to the beautiful city library of Berlin. And it's this gorgeous, capacious building designed by one of these brilliant German architects named Hans Scharoun. And I was given access to the Dietrich Bonhoeffer papers. Now I'm gonna sound kind of like a book geek and maybe like, you know, uh, your annoying college professor for a minute. But I want to tell you that access to these 25 boxes of papers that were just sold to the university uh, library by the family of one of Bonhoeffer's best friends proved, in my experience, deeply transformative. There, here's the context. 25 years ago this spring, I submitted a lumbering 505-page dissertation at the University of Virginia on Dietrich Bonhoeffer's philosophical theology. Now, I'm not going to read anything from that book tonight, but I will tell you that what I began to see when I opened these boxes and every morning in that gorgeous, light-filled, uh, almost kind of transcendent space that is the Staatsbibliothek um, were pieces of paper, writings, photographs, images, notes, entries from journals and diaries that offered in my mind a, an intriguingly, a very dramatically different image than this brilliant philosophical theologian and sort of martyr of the Christian church that many people know Dietrich Bonhoeffer to be. Let me tell you about some of the things I found in this archive. I found some gorgeous landscape photographs that Bonhoeffer had taken on his two trips to Northern Africa. And these were gorgeous kind of austere photographs of uh, Islamic life in Libya and then in Morocco. I found a bank statement from a joint bank account that Bonhoeffer shared with his best friend and soulmate, Eberhard Beitka. I know this may also sound a little obscure to you, but I didn't know how tall Bonhoeffer was until I found a little registration paper for an, auto, uh, an Audi convertible that his father 
the preeminent psychiatrist in Berlin gave him in 1936, and I discovered that he was six feet one, which is you know, a pretty tall fellow. I found a correspondence, a brief correspondence uh, from 1934 with Mahatma Gandhi. So this is a very interesting correspondence. Bonhoeffer, as you know, and if you don't, I'll tell you now, was a German pastor and theologian who in 1933, when Hitler ascended to power and was appointed chancellor of Germany and the Nuremberg laws were passed, Bonhoeffer was really a kind of voice crying in the wilderness, was one of the first, if not the only member of the Christian community at that time who spoke with clarity and prescience about the emergence of what he would later call a, the great masquerade of evil that was appearing in this time and in this place. Within weeks of the passage of the Nuremberg Laws and this whole slate of anti-Semitic policies, Bonhoeffer was going on record saying that in response to the rise of Nazism, people of faith were not simply obligated to bandage the victims under the wheel, but to smash the wheel itself. So this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this extraordinary person of faith. And in this uh, correspondence with Mahatma Gandhi, one year after the passage of the Nuremberg Laws, Bonhoeffer is beginning to conclude that there is something deeply broken and flawed about the Protestant tradition, not only in Germany, but really the Protestant tradition as it, it exists in modern Christendom. And he was looking for pockets of spiritual energy and for communities that were clustering around peacemaking and contemplative practices outside of the West. And he was invited by Gandhi to come live on his ashram in India. And it was a regret that Bonhoeffer had all of his life that he was not able to make it to India. Instead, he went and formed a radical community of peacemaking in northeast Germany in this area called Pomerania. What else did I find in that stash? I found, um, I found an inventory of his wardrobe. So it turns out that this, that this great a uh, person of conscience, this activist, this brilliant thinker, philosopher, was also a bit of a clothes hound. And in this inventory, uh, I discovered that Bonhoeffer actually kept a very meticulous record of his dress, of where he liked to buy his best, his, 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 his um, leather shoes and his furs, his favorite haberdasher, and all kinds of esoterica of his wardrobe not so surprising, was a meticulous inventory of his library. Bonhoeffer at the age of, of 12 or 13, in a, in a letter to Father Christmas, had asked for the complete writings of Immanuel Kant. So it wasn't particularly surprising that he kept a meticulous record of his wardrobe. In any case, these aspects of a life, these surprising details, began to nudge me, not so gently, into biography. So I'm going to read a short passage from the first chapter. When he was a young child, can you hear OK? And his family rented a sprawling villa near the university clinics in Breslau, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his twin sister, Sabina, lay awake at night trying to imagine eternity. The ritual eventually became a game, with each child concentrating on the word to clear the mind of distractions. On funeral days, as horse-drawn hearses approached the cemetery that lay just to the north, the twins would watch from their bedroom window. Eternity, Ewigkeit, Sabina found the word very long and gruesome. Dietrich found it majestic, an awesome word, he called it. 
Sometimes he would pitch.